Hey everybody, welcome back to the Lucky Doll Podcast. This is your host, Elias Roush. Today we are discussing Sweet Home. Not the webtoon, but the Netflix new television series. It is a drama, horror, apocalyptic style television show. I would most basically equate it to uh, a Korean Walking Dead. And it's not exactly with zombies, though. Walking Dead is, uh, you know, the apocalypse with zombies. This is more or less the apocalypse with these monsters. And so this is actually based off of uh, the uh, line webtoon of the same name by uh, Ken Khan B and Huang Yang Chan. Um, apologies if I don't get the names and pronunciations correct. I'm still uh, learning uh, you know, basic Korean pronun- pronunciation. So I'm just like pronunciation, punctuation. And so, uh, you know, bear with me on that. Um, yes. So anyways, I was, uh, laying around watching Netflix. I was like, all right, what's going on? What's going on on Netflix? I like some international Netflix, uh, television shows like money heist. I've covered a lot of those and I was like, ah, oh, let's check something out. So I just wanted to kind of pick something very niche and that's what, uh, Netflix really likes to thrive in. And so um, I was like, all right, sweet home, I'll check it out. And so this first episode, I was uh, I was pretty intrigued. I will say for the uh, the good things about this uh, television series is overall from a non spoiler point of view, just real quickly. um, It's entertaining. It's got decent actors that are really trying to push this uh, kind of B grade action um feel it definitely feels like it's it belongs on netflix in my opinion the things that draw this that kind of hold this television show back are strictly the cgi and the computer graphics that are surrounding this i do think practically i do think this uh show looks really good i think from a cinematography standpoint direction overall I think it generally works as a television show. It's entertaining to the point where I think it was nine episodes when it uh, was released on December 18th, 2020. Sorry, 10 episodes. But um, it lasting from 44 minutes to an hour long. I enjoyed my time watching Sweet Home. I do feel there are a few points in within the uh, campiness of the pacing of the show. It definitely... Uh, drags in some parts in the middle of the series, but I do think overall I enjoyed my time. Um, I was actually looking at some uh, information regarding the Webtoon series that they uh, had released back in 2017. I'd never even heard of this. It was a South Korean Webtoon by uh, Kim uh, Carnby and uh, illustrated by Huang Young Chan. And uh, yeah, I think they went on to have like a total of 140 chapters uh, plus one prologue. I was like, good lord, they, they really put some stuff out. Um, and so, yeah, a print version of Sweet Home was uh, released on February 28, 2020 by Wisdom House. House. And so it was uh, that was actually what was adapted into the Netflix series of the same name. And so... Overall, it does center around the same stories. It, uh, the synopsis is uh, following the death of the family of an accident. Loner Chai Hyun So moves to a new apartment. His quiet life is soon disrupted by strange accidents or incidents that start occurring in his new building. As people turn into monsters, which take the form of their hidden desires. Huan So and other residents try to survive. So it feels in a way, because of the way this uh, this story is structured, um, in comparison to The Walking Dead, Walking Dead, they generally go to like one single, once uh one season they'll stick in one place and just stay there for a little bit and then maybe move to the next location something happens to the location gets run down kind of thing they're kind of taking that formula in a way and in in a way that 
they're not staying in just one compound. They're staying in like one apartment building in this series. So this entire uh, season feels kind of like a bottle film in, in a way that they're all stuck in this like one place. However, I do feel that the pacing is affected. Um, somewhere in the middle, I think it's just uh, a little bit saggy with how much... Uh, story is happening there's a lot of characters that we're trying to get some backstory on it's not always a hundred percent um go 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 as it feels in the first few episodes i think the first two episodes i feel like the the pacing is like you feel it they're monsters outside the designs of the monsters are so random and you don't know ever what you're gonna get which is kind of um exciting in a way that you are always seeing a different type of monster but the monsters are awful they look like ps2 graphics i'm some of the worst graphics i've seen uh on a professional production in many years i think i i you know i i've criticized some computer uh animated stuff like cgi and i I don't know if it was due to lack of budget. I don't know if it was due to the, the outsourcing of the studios or something like that, that it didn't transfer. Was it my TV? I don't know. Are they gonna, Are they able to go back and um, re-render some of these scenes? Possibly. Um, but from what I saw, it looked like unfinished PS2 graphics in some scenes, which was quite jarring, in my opinion, to the subsequent practical effects that we're seeing on many of the scenes. I feel like what makes this show really work on this first episode is we are like kind of endeared to uh, this main character and uh, Song Kang. Um, sorry, Song Kang plays uh, Cha Hyun So, um, the main uh, depressed high school student who uh, has... Uh, is living in the green home after his family is uh, killed in a car accident. And so I feel like we're immediately endeared into this world by simply the direction and the way that they're, they've opened the show. They, we see kind of a flash forward into episode 10, but um, and then we do like a flashback all the way to how we, how we got to this point. And so I got to say that overall, yeah, it's an entertaining series. It's not perfect. It definitely could use some uh, fixer uppers on um, the uh, what's it called the CGI. Oh, and one more thing: Imagine Dragons. What in the fuck did Imagine Dragons have to do to get their song on this television series? Maybe six times. I feel like it's almost every th every third episode that they play the song. Um, fucking Imagine Dragons, uh, I don't know how many fucking times, and it just, it pulls me so far out of this fucking television show that I couldn't even, uh, I couldn't believe it, I, I, I don't even remember what the hell the song was, but I should remember it by the time I fucking heard it 20 times, um, but yeah, I, I think that, um, overall, it's an entertaining, and it's going to be a successful, uh, uh, kind of like Korean monster walking dead for Netflix. And it's entertaining enough for us in, uh, uh, in the States, or at least it was entertaining enough for me in the States that I was able to forgive some of the, uh, the effects that didn't look so good. I still thought it was still entertaining just to kind of see all these different, um, backstories i i'm kind of a sucker for the the lost style of storytelling when i say lost the television show they had you know a group of people are on an island and we're trying to figure out how to get off the island but then they do an episode by episode with these flashbacks it's a very standard storytelling method of you know how did all these people get to this one place and who are these who were these people before the world went to to normally the world went to shit but before the world was changed and so yeah i i think that we are endeared to the majority of these characters they're they're fun and interesting to watch and uh i did listen to the dubbed version um i don't think all the voices work for that uh and uh it, it i it's it's difficult i i the thing about dubbed is the human brain can detect when 
first of all, lip syncs aren't like aren't uh, word for word. But then it can drive people nuts if they're watching the captions as well, and the captions don't match what uh, what they're saying on the voice, and then the voiceover. So the thing is, a lot of Netflix voice over international content is done in studio is what it sounds like in my opinion i can personally hear the fact that they didn't master the dubbed version of some of these main characters like they were in the apartment building like they should be so when what i'm saying is like the main character might be uh standing downstairs in a lobby area and it sounds like the dubbed version is a guy sitting in a booth and so it can take people out of the out of the moment when the sound doesn't match what they're saying or, or the or even the place that they're at if it sounds like there's like an extreme echo it's like and they're not in a place that should be echoing it just it, immediately something feels off and so I won't say that this was committing that big of you know crimes by doing that stuff. Um, I think that ma the majority of this is still entertaining enough that um, I was willing to forgive it. So let's talk about the first episode, episode one, um, right here. In September 2020, Cha Yun So In is a soldier's target in what appears to be a no man's land. One month earlier, he moves into the apartment complex, Green Home, where a variety of people live. Depressed and suicidal, he avoids going outside and relies on food deliveries. One night, he realizes that his ramen delivery was opened by his neighbor and witnesses a woman holding the head of a dead cat in the apartment next door. He rushes into his apartment, but is followed by his neighbor asking for help before turning into a glutton monster. The neighbor turning into the glutton monster. Meanwhile, on the ground floor, residents cannot go out of the building, which is on lockdown, and one of them dies in the hands of a vampire monster. So these different uh, like glutton monsters and uh, vampire monsters. There's it's like quotations around it. It's some there's a correlation to how people are turning into the monsters. It's it's like their deepest kind of desire in a way that just makes them turn ugly. You know, to an extent. Now I'm not going to talk about every episode because we just don't simply have the time. But I will say from the colors to the technicals. I enjoyed this first episode. I, this was what really hooked me. I think that uh, the beginning shots really uh, solidify the place, the time, the the feeling of what we're going for. And I just love the look of this. I, the, the colors are, are kind of boosted in a way that I really enjoy. Um, let me see if I have any other specifics on this first episode. Um, yeah, the cinematography, I thought the direction, I thought that was really good camera work with this and the editing as well. The editing, uh, see, it's, it may be cheap when it comes to the CGI not looking great, but I still think the practical effects, the acting, the cinematography, directing, editing, all of that works on all the cylinders that they needed to do. Um, the cons might be that the, the writing can be a little bit, a little bit forward, a little bit on the nose, and that might be due to the translation of into English. So I will, you know, put that caveat. So yes, they're in the greenhouse dish district. I think you kind of figure out that this is a, a kind of a campy television show, even in this first one. Um, it's kind of horrifying and funny, very much in the style of like evil dead in a way, but I don't know if I was like laughing out loud, but I was chuckling a few times. I, I like the fact is I feel like they know that they don't have the best effects in this. And so as long as you can get on board with that, then you're okay. So uh, uh, the practical effects are so good that it, it makes the CGI make that look that much worse. Although I did see some stop motion. Um, I believe it was stop motion, which I thought looked a little bit better with the other uh, monsters. Um, yeah. And it's like weird music cues at some points. Um, there's a pull out the big wide shot when you find out that they're stuck in this apartment and there's tons of these monsters all over the place. It 
it made me laugh out loud. I mean, I was just like, ah! <laughs> I was just like, what is going on? It pulls out to the point where you're like, all right, this was supposed to be really critical to the, the, the plot of the movie and saying, oh my gosh, there's monsters everywhere. Oh my God. You know, um, and they're trying to get them. But the point is it, it looked like they pulled out and there's a, a, a theme park up the road. It's like Disney World. It's like a cheap Disney World. It feels like they pulled out to a cheap uh, Halloween World or something like that. It it just feels like a theme park. Like people are outside and the monsters are kind of all over the place. It looks like some people, some of them are actual people that are dressed up as monsters, and then other monsters just look like terrible CGI. It was it had me rolling. I was just like, all right, this was supposed to be like the big epic shot because. At the point where they're trying to fight the monster at the uh, the monster at the very bottom of the uh, of the lobby, I think that's the vampire monster. Um, that thing's kind of scary because you can't really see it when they hide it in the shadows. But then when you see it, it's like, oh my god, it looks like a fucking PS2 uh, boss character in the Resident Evil or something like that. It's just like, what is going on? And so, yeah, you find out the world's coming to an end and. I don't think that everybody exactly sells this. I, I because I can't pronounce everybody's name. I don't think I'll go too much into the detail of the acting, but um, and I didn't have too much uh to complain about the acting. I thought the majority of it was was decent. Um, the kids were the kids, you know. The uh, I'm not gonna go in on them. Um, yeah, but uh, there's a pretty good, pretty there's there's good cinematography and decent direction in this that makes you want to stick around and the blood oh my gosh the blood gushing from people's noses is just fucking disgusting i was like i can't even do this i don't know how everybody was uh was i don't i don't know how they were able to make such a uh, a good practical effect of you know the blood coming out of their nose it doesn't look like any packets or anything or like holding them up but it was just disgusting i was like ugh, sick <laughs> and so um yeah and when our main character uh Hyun so i believe um is looking into like the screen of where his uh, his neighbor is trying to like attack um that's when i figured out that this is like kind of campy it's like when the monsters start talking funny it's just like all right this is starting to turn from like horror to like horror comedy in the the evil dead zone um, like the Sam Raimi's. So yeah, each episode kind of goes through like a, uh, all right, who was this character? What were they doing before all this? And it's entertaining as hell. I, I I'm not gonna, not gonna lie. Um, I'll I'll do episode two real quick, and then we'll hop into the final episode. Asleep and guarded by his upstairs neighbor, Jaiso Hikamori, Yin So relieves the last sorry relives the last moments before his parents and sister's death deaths in a car crash as well as the funeral where he blames them not for leaving him enough money to survive saying uh i mean that was that that that's uh that's crazy as hell just uh that first sentence of the second episode i feel like you're immediately endeared to this character in the second episode even though you saw him and kind of where he was coming from the first episode and people being an asshole to him. The, the one girl saying, don't kill yourself here. You're just making a burden on everybody else. You do find out there are people in this uh, apartment complex that some are for him, that are want to help him, and some are against him. And uh, really depends on which character you're looking at. And so, um, yeah, that is a scary thought, not leaving enough money to survive. Sang Wook kills the glutton monster. Jai So and Jai Hen encounter the Lotus Root Monster. Um, and see, I gotta say that these specific quote-unquote Lotus Root, Gluten Monster, Vampire Monster, Glutton Monster, I didn't think that it was immediately clear to the viewer that these were uh, correlated with like characteristics and stuff like that. I, it, the monsters just seem too broad to really say that, oh yeah, that's definitely what he is. Um, I, did, I wouldn't even have called that thing a, a vampire monster at, the, at one point. Um, 
But on the f- ground floor, conflicts start to arise between residents as they learn more about their situation and how people turn into monsters. Hyun So saves two orphan siblings whose father was killed by the eyeball monster. Like, what the fuck is the eyeball monster? Like, uh, th- that's clearly the eyeball monster because it's all he fucking had. He was an eyeball with a big uh, that went from his head, I guess. I don't remember exactly, but um, it's like, how is that like from your biggest desire? Was he like a peeping Tom or something like that? <laughs> and so he's just like looking in people's windows like, what's going on in there? And so there was one thing that I forgot to mention in the before we started going into the detail about it. But um, there is little screenshots that you see or like before you click play on Netflix. And I got to say that the, these different types of monsters were all shown on that screen at one point or right before you click play onto it. And I kind of wish they didn't do that, but um, they literally have uh, just like a, the play screen for sweet home has the outside exterior shot with all of the monsters that you're going to see in the series. And so when I first saw that, I thought it was kind of whimsical and uh, kind of campy, like, Hey, look at all these monsters and these people are trying to kill them. You know, it was, it was that, that kind of thing. But when you click and play it, it's much more horror based, I guess, and much more suspense based and less Sam Raimi based. But I feel like they kind of, start with horror then they run into this like uh horror comedy kind of thing and then it becomes this kind of campy campy um show and it really shows that this is not taking this a hundred percent seriously in my opinion was when hyun so saves the two orphan uh siblings and then is saved within return of his disabled neighbor do sick uh, but soon starts to exhibiting symptoms, um, our main character. So, um, yeah, the thing is, when Do Sick comes in and shoots the fucking eyeball monster with this uh, uh, rigged up, uh, what is it called? Like, uh, when you break your leg, uh, what is it? Oh my god, did I seriously forget what it is? Oh, yeah, yeah, it was a uh, crutches, crutches, that's what it was. Sorry. Anyways, uh, yeah, so when Do Sick ends up saying, like, all right, this is how it's going down, I'm going to take this eyeball thing out, and he fucking shoots the thing, and the eyeball thing explodes, eyeball monster, and saves our main character. There's, I think this is when it's like, dang, 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 dang. this is the badass music because he's badass. Like, it was like, like that type of thing it's like when our we've seen it on tons of apocalyptic things um i can't think of any on the top of my head but we've seen it before when our main character is in severe danger and then all of a sudden you know some old guy who's been or some old character who's been living in this apocalypse comes out of nowhere um deus ex old guy style and or old person style and comes through and basically um, saves their life and it's just like okay this is clearly the character we're gonna have to uh, lose later on because they become some sort of mentor character or like a uh, character that um, like father grandpa figure it's definitely it's, it's like the trifecta it's like they teach our main character things how to live how to survive give them tools and this is exactly what do sick does as well and then they have their own badass music when they show up um and this is where i found out that it was not exactly a full serious television show and i was like all right i can go with this if as long as they're not taking themselves too seriously and i didn't really mention in the first episode there was one asshole um that we find out hold on let me see let me see Choi Young Jae um played by Go Go Gyeon Han I'm sorry if I'm saying these names wrong I like I said earlier I'm trying my best guys and gals but um it's the guy that we first see he is wrapped up in fucking tape all the fucking way from his head to his toes and we see uh what do we see? Like uh, a gangster guy. Like I, I can't find his name at this point. Um, 
because of names. I'm just, I don't know these names. I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, there's a gangster guy like uh, that has this has this guy tied up all in tape, and we're like, "What the fuck is going on?" Okay, so he was beaten up by uh, Payon Sang Wook. I'm trying to see if why can I not find this character's Payon? I don't see. I don't even know if that's the character's name or the actor's name. Well, sorry about that, y'all. Anyways, um, damn, seriously can't find this guy. So anyways, this guy is being beaten up, beaten up, like, we're like, what the fuck is going on? Why is this guy being tortured by uh, this gangster guy? And we find out later, I mean, it's almost immediate. As soon as this guy rips the tape off his face and he starts talking to people downstairs, he just sounds fucking weird. He's he's doing weird things. He's acting all suspicious, very sus. Probably need to kick him out of the airlock at this point. But anyways, um, they they do a good job with that guy. They uh, he he's he's introduced in a very odd way, and you're like, why the fuck is this guy being tortured? Later we find out he's a fucking pedophile, and he has a fucking room full of uh like old school like like he lives in 1998 or something like that type stuff like he doesn't have a computer he has it all printed out it's like terrible stuff and so um yeah anyways i will say uh finishing up episode two our main character starts exhibiting symptoms which is a good hook for you know wanting to jump into the next episode normally episode twos are not nearly as strong as episode ones but i feel like this one really was when our main character starts exhibiting symptoms, we're like, oh, fuck, then anybody can get it. And then eventually we do find out more about these monsters. Um, let's hop to episode 10 because I do not have all the time in the world. Um, let me see. And I will say this looks like it was all directed and written by the same team. Lee Young Bok, Jung Woo, sorry, Jung Young Woo and Park So Young are the directors, and it was written by Hong So Ri, Kim Young Min, and Park So Jung. And like I said, apologies for any of the mispronunciations. This is all with respect. I'm just trying to say the names right. You know what I'm saying, everybody. So, um, let me see anything else we got. Um, let me see. Let me see. Okay, so episode 10. As, hold on, before I hop into episode 10, a couple of the random things I'm just remembering of this show were that big fucking monster. I don't know what the big fucking monster was called. Um, I kind of wish I had the name of it, but um, I think it was like episode four or five. Let's see if I can find that monster. Um, yeah, I don't think I can find it, but there's a big fucking monster. And... He is crushing one of the main characters, one of the uh, the characters downstairs. Um, they're like baby carriage or something like that. Empty baby carriage. And we find out that this lady has lost her daughter or baby. I don't remember if it was a daughter, but it lost her baby at a um, tra in traffic or something like that something like the the carriage had gone into traffic and for some reason um because well not for some reason she just doesn't want to leave the uh baby carriage and so it was a very moving scene with this ugly cgi monster um like ps2 thing just crushing her uh baby carriage and it was kind of crushing you know that character mentally as well she was just it was kind of forcing her to uh come to grips that her baby has actually passed and so i could totally see the relatability in a way of how you know the monsters are supposed to relate to them um yeah with their desire for i guess a a different just for their desires and she was desiring to have her daughter back obviously or, or her baby back i don't like i said i don't remember if it was a baby uh what, what the gender of the baby was but um she just wants the baby back but that monster is forcing her i mean by physically 
closing that door and then turns around and wham fucking fucking lands a fucking punch directly on her fucking head and i was just like holy santa claus i was just <laughs> like damn did you just literally tell this lady that she has to go that she has to from from the story standpoint we're finding out that this lady's baby has been taken out and we see it from like a flashback like the 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 baby carriage was hit in traffic and then you're gonna lay literally this punch on this lady after she's lost her baby you're gonna physically assault this lady with this giant protein okay i think is it this protein monster is that what it is this giant fucking huge ass monster and just punches her directly in the face i was just like god dang y'all are savage i was like super savage and then all of a sudden um you know, he turns around and then she jumps on and starts attacking. It is it 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 definitely got me. I was like, God dang! I, you see, that was some crazy shit I had never seen before. And you know what? Give give or take uh, your opinions on the CGI. I've told you mine enough that they didn't look finished. But regardless, I was just like, Holy shit! This is fucking savage. And uh, I was like, This is crazy. And so. Uh, that's where it leads into the unpredictability uh, realm, which I really enjoyed. And so that was one of the main scenes I, I enjoyed. There was some talk of some mon the, the 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 golden hour of the monsters. Then we have, uh, you know, I think the time that you can kill them. I believe for some reason some monsters just wanted to kill. Some reason some monsters wanted to save people. It just. Um, I don't know if that was 100% explored in, in ways that made 100% sense. There is a main character. I don't rem Let me see if I can find his name. Um, Middle-aged man, grocery store owner, and, uh, Sun Young's wife, senior caregiver, same, then sticks around, and bass guitarist. Uh, the, no. John Wong. Maybe. No. No. I'm trying to find... Uh, Former firefighter, lady, mysterious man, scar on face, medical oh medical student Lee Lee Yun Hyuk, a medical student in Yun Yun's Yun sorry Yun Yu's older brother. He is the brain and leader of the building survivors. He handles everything with calm mind and rational decisions. Um, he appears to be cold hearted. He definitely was one of my favorites to watch. I just thought he had a very nice aesthetic um, along alongside our main character. But then there's a character turn on this uh, Lee Yun Hyuk that, first of all, I didn't see what was coming at the end. I think he ends up going down. But if you're a monster, since everybody's a monster, is anybody really dead um, at that point? But there was a point where I was like, we want to root behind this guy, but then him and his sister are having this, um, you know, this powwow in public, and he fucking just cocks back and slaps the shit out of her. And I was like, damn it, Lee Young. I was like, or sorry, whatever. Um, <laughs> damn it, Lee. I was like, you didn't have to do that, and now I can't root for you anymore. You're a fucking abuser. It's like, now I have to think that. This asshole might have been, you know, beating up on his sister for longer than he has. I don't think that's the case, but because they put that in the uh, show and they, we can't 100% root for this guy, it's like, son of a bitch. Like, there was a lot of violence against women in this series, and, uh, and we're still rooting for a guy that has, uh, does it straight blatantly in front of us. It's like, I, I would not would not have put that in there if you want us to root for this guy um let me see who else uh go mean sai as leon so leon yo i'm sorry if i'm saying all this wrong but um the the younger sister of lee who i was just talking about and she's a former ballerina lives with a brother kind of thing um wow she is an asshole majority of this and the thing about it is 
we find out more and more about her, but I still feel like she was so cynical to the people around her. Even our main character, uh, uh, Chai Yun So. I was just like, can you give the guy a break? I mean, my lord. And so, yeah, we have, um, yeah, lots of interesting different characters. That, like I said, there was a lot of violence against women, specifically with this one asshole um, grocery store owner who's abusive to his wife, Kim Suk Yun. And he definitely sucked. Um, no pun intended, but he just like, uh, the, the actor. Uh, Wu Yun, he did an especially good job playing a despicable asshole, but they did not have to go 100% hog while was showing all the abuse towards his, his uh, wife. That was just a little bit excessive. Um, anything else? I don't really think I have much more to say about it until the last episode. Like, there was, uh, there is some like backstory between. Uh, one of the characters' fiancés possibly giving information about the uh, the curse is what they're calling it, I believe, throughout this thing instead of a disease. Um, and this is happening all through uh, us having watching this. We're watching it at the same time as COVID is. And so when they're talking about people exhibiting symptoms, when people are, um, uh, are turning into... Uh, strongholds and stuff like that and having to stay in one place and isolate and do all this it feels so reminiscent of uh what's happening in real life in a way that i was like i don't know if i want all this in my in my uh my entertainment so that's why i kind of binge through it pretty quickly but anyways let's uh hop into the final episode so uh episode 10 as the elevator opens yunso introduces uh Yui Yi Mayong to the rest of the survivors and states that he is just like himself, which caused the group to stand down. Upon burning and killing the goo monster, um, which I didn't understand what the goo monster originally was, it was helps the kid at one point. Uh Yi Yi Myung believes humans and monsters cannot coexist. So this is just taking out of the uh this is the group that always happens in all of the different factions of apocalypticism i guess there's always our group and then there's going to be the other group and there's normally the other group that we can't trust this is a trope and kind of a cliche in most apocalyptic scenario television shows and movies um but it always gets me every time because I'm always interested to see who we can trust and who we can't. When Sang Wook attempts to take Yuri outside after finding her having an asthma attack, he is stopped by Myung, who won't allow them, who won't let them go, knowing they will be eliminated by the military during Operation Golden Hour, um, which would eliminate everyone and everything. Yunso allows Seng Wook to leave, but this causes Myung to open fire and kill two survivors. It is only after Yunso turns into a monster that he is stopped. Uh, our main character. Dusik sacrifices himself to calm down Yunso um, after the bodies are. Sorry, to calm down Yunso. Um, Yunso turns literally turns into like this crazy um like phoenix type ps2 cgi character that looked like it probably belonged in like constantine or something like that but it is a really cool visual and sad at the same time but it was also very reminiscent of or sorry it was it was predictable on the part of all right, we're going to need somebody to calm down Yunso. And he just really, all Yunso really needed was a hug. But um, that's all, you know, that that's all we really need. Um, I will say I was surprised as hell when um, Mion kills uh, the team leader, Yunso, um, just throwing him down and uh, murders the most of the team. Um, I was just like, holy Santa Claus, where is this going? Because we see like 
bits and pieces of uh, Miong at one point, just small clips, nothing crazy. We're just like, all right, this guy is probably a little smarter than what he appears. But Hyun So was really the the apocalyptic leader of the other other side, and he was just munching on that fucking gum. I about wanted to jump through the screen and throw him off the building myself. I was just like, this is insane. I was like, okay, okay. Yeah, the show, you're, you're kind of going for a little bit of unpredictability with that. But, um, yeah, so what do we have? Um, so Dusik sacrifices himself to calm down Yun So. This is when all the stabby stabbies going through Dusik, and that was, you know, sad and everything. After the bodies are burned, Winter arrives as well as Winter arrives. Is this just like uh, the time progression in this? So, my biggest issue with the show was I felt like at some points they weren't acting like there was monsters trying to get inside. They just were sitting around, kind of diddling their thumbs. Like, dude, I would always be sharpening knives. I would always be boarding up shit. I would always be doing something if I was in this scenario. You couldn't find a second for me to sit down and, uh, you know, relax like some of them are doing in this. It just does it kind of blows my mind. Um, but uh, yeah, as the winter arrives, as well as the military, who say the survivors will be transferred to a safety camp as well as the infected should surrender. Yun So goes to confront the military while the apartment building starts to collapse as a result of surviving. Outlaw causing an explosion and Yun Hyuk uh, is killed during the collapse. That's the our main, the calm collective guy with the glasses that slapped his sister. <laughs> Sorry, I gave him excellent. During the collapse, just as his nose starts ble to bleed. So we do find out that he was infected as well. So anybody that's infected does seem to have the ability to come back in some sort of way, which is why I don't understand why the main our main character... I guess he makes it out of the golden hour every time he's the monster or something. I, I'm, I'm still kind of unclear. The survivors make it above ground after entering the tunnels and are transferred to a safety camp. Uh, Yi Kung, sorry, Yi Kyung decides to join the military and advises the survivors to stay alive. And of course, just like many of the other tropes, we do have to have a traitor. And so... I do enjoy this little unpredictable spin they have on this one. I don't feel like that's always shown. But uh, everybody is so surprised. Like, what? Um, yeah, they <laughs> we what? <laughs> She's like, y'all stay alive right now? And she hops in her own car and just, uh, you know, goes off. Hyun So wakes up in an armored vehicle after confronting the military and is greeted by Sang Wook. Sang Wook is only to realize it is instead Miong who has taken the form of Sang Wook. Sang Wook was the gangster who was uh, torturing the guy that was taped up, and he ends up, I think he's running out with the guitar girl? Is it? Is that who he's running out with? He has one of the girls on his back, and he's running to try to escape, and he's just shot up, I think. I don't remember exactly how he's killed by uh, Miong, the other monster guy. Um, so the ending of this is kind of like a doo, doo 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 doo, you know, Twilight Zone, like, oh shit, like he's not dead. Like, all right, first of all, we knew he wasn't going to be dead. Every time we've seen somebody, him take on the form of somebody, he's like this little goo thing. And if they don't really get rid of the goo thing, you, you're done, son, you're done. One and you're done. And so, like I said, if you're a monster, which technically anybody can technically be in this show, it gives them the opportunity to bring almost anybody back, which kind of can reduce, you know, how much you feel about the characters like that. We can technically have Sang Wook back for a while, but it's not really Sang Wook. Um, so mixed feeling about that. I wonder how the next season is going to be. And I'm actually not exactly sure how much uh, this does follow the original tune. Um, let me see. Let me see. The series was praised for viewers for high quality visual effects. What the hell? This was on Wiki. I, did y'all watch the same shit as I did? 
Oh my god. Um. Anyways, that's so crazy. I, I'm looking at visual effects, legacy effects, the, the visual effects studio of Westworld, and sp sorry, visual effects studio Westworld and Spectral Motion. They've worked on films as Avatar, Avengers, Game of Thrones, Stranger Things. What the hell? This does not feel like from that studio at all. Or I. J my goodness and i've seen i've seen much better stuff on all of those all of those uh shows and properties so anyways let me know what you thought about sweet home and i about said sweet home alabama because i guess everybody just wants to say it after that i guess that's kind of the thing that you just want to say after that but anyways um yeah let me know what you thought about um sweet home uh this uh, Netflix series. Let me know how I can improve on the podcast. Let me know um, anything else. Rate, share, subscribe. Look at our podcast. Follow. Uh, what is it? Five stars on iTunes. Do what you can to support the podcast to let us grow. And um, yeah, thank you for listening, watching. Look at our podcast. Patreon.com slash look at our podcast for uh tv movies media get everything early get get this podcast early get it full get it mastered get it good all right everyone take it easy